Good morning. It's so nice to see you. Happy Friday. This is my favorite day of the week on the show because I get a chance to go through all of the questions that were sent in throughout the week through our social channels. So that's our YouTube, which you're probably seeing me on right now, Phoenix Spine and Joint. But also our Facebook, we have a sister site, hiproplacement.info, and they have a Facebook. So all of these things collate together and trickle down and we get to get to tackle them on Friday. So without much further ado, let's get started. First one is from Elaine Weinbrenner. Good morning, Elaine, happy Friday. I'm 69 and I have spondylolisthesis at L45 for years where one vertebrae has slipped forward. Standing and walking hurts. The pain is limited to my lower back. There's no pain down my leg. Ah, well that is a very important clue. Thank you for providing it. Let's start out with that word that's so hard to pronounce and say, and yet alone know what it means, and that's spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis, for those of you who get interested in the study of words, spondylo means bone and listhesis means moved, and this is a model of the spine. Elaine's problem is between L4 and L5, and you can see there's normally a little bit of a curve to the spine, that's normal in all of us, but the back of each bone lines up with the, the bottom of the bone lines up with the top of the one below. In spondylolisthesis, that's no longer the case. One bone has shifted forward. Usually when you have spondylolisthesis, when the bones do this, the spinal canal does this. So typically spondylolisthesis, the shifting of the bones, causes a narrowing of the spinal canal, which you know is also called stenosis, narrowing. It just means stenosis. Stenosis causes pain down the legs with walking, which Elaine doesn't have. So that's good. She does not have spondylolisthesis with stenosis. She's just got most likely spondylolisthesis. Of course, the way to find out for sure would be on the MRI. X-ray is gonna show us how the bones have moved but the MRI is gonna show us the severity of that narrowing. I wouldn't even get an MRI if she's not having any leg pain or problems controlling the bladder or numbness, especially sensitive for perineal numbness, that's numbness in your private parts, your vagina, down around to the rectum. Here in Arizona, we say anywhere your bum touches the saddle, that's your perineum, that area. If any numbness in there, that's an emergency, you gotta get imaged right away. But in general, it uh, sounds like that's not an issue. Four out of five people with spondylolisthesis never require surgery. So even though it's kind of like the situation with lung cancer, 10 out of 10 smokers, 10 out of 10 people with lung cancer were smokers, actually nine out of 10, but only one out of 10 smokers get lung cancer. It's the same way with spondylolisthesis. Ten, almost t nine, nine or 10 out of 10 people having a spinal fusion have spondylolisthesis with stenosis. But eight out of 10 people with spondylolisthesis don't require surgery. So that's an important thing to realize is that it's unlikely, Elaine, that surgery would ever be necessary. So that's certainly a little piece of good news. Um, she started physical therapy. Radiofrequency ablation has been suggested as the next option. Kudos, sounds like you're seeing the right doctors because they're absolutely right. Okay, well, if you don't have stenosis, Elaine's not having the leg pain, why does it, what hurts? Why does anything hurt? Well, there's really two main other choices. If it's not stenosis, and that means it's not a nerve root, then it's either a tear in a disc, which is possible, but less likely. That's usually a knife in the back, not off to the side and down to the butt. And then the other kind of pain is facet pain, joint pain of the spine. And our facet joints, the hardest working, least famous joints in the human body, these are them. There's one, there's one, there's one. Come on, people, everybody knows the knuckle and the elbow and the wrist. That's just the names of joints. How come we don't know the facet joint? How come no one can ever name it? Because she's all covered up with muscle. So Elaine's got all her back muscles here and then her skin. So you can't see it, whereas the other joints are right on the surface. So we forget about the facet joints, but they're in there. 
All right, Elaine, um, so radiofrequency ablation, pain is probably coming from the joints, and so that is likely the next step. Uh, I don't want to have it as it's temporary. The nerves regenerate. Uh, true that. So uh, the, the radiofrequency ablation, the outcome, has been studied by a series of small studies. That's where doctors kind of put together, oh, I got 20 cases, how'd they do? Oh, I got 100 cases, how'd they do? No, not a really good studies, but small series taken together. And I take from looking at, I looked at all those studies so that you don't have to, although feel free and let me know what you think. But as it turns out, the um, if you take them all together, it looks to me like 60% of the people, so 10 people having radiofrequency ablation, six of them are going to get 80% or more pain relief for an average of 10 months. 60, 80, 10. 60% of the people are going to get 80% relief for 10 months. Your outcome may vary. Don't try this at home, right? So that there's that those are averages. So the 40% uh, of the people are going to get less than average relief. Doesn't mean they get no relief. They just don't get good relief. And then there's going to be some absolute home run balls, right? There's going to be some people out there who they had the radiofrequency ablation and 100% of their pain went away and they swear by it and it's the best procedure on earth. Well, it was for them. For whatever reason, it worked great for them and kudos to you. But that's not the usual. What you should expect going into it is you got a 60% chance of getting about 80% relief and it's going to last for 10 months. Uh, Elaine doesn't like it because it's temporary. Yeah, it is. The only way to make that permanent is to, instead of going in there and burning those nerves, when you burn a nerve, it starts to recover the next day and eventually it recovers. Elaine used the term regenerate, which was a good term. Uh, it, the, if you cut the nerve though, it cannot ever recover. It can't reconnect itself. I can tell you trying to reconnect nerves is tough business. It's microsurgery. You can't do it on your own. So there are endoscopic procedures called direct visualized rhizotomy or dorsal, radio free, dorsal endoscopic um, radiofrequency rhizotomy, where a surgeon can go in there <clears throat> with a scope and identify that little nerve and then zzz, cut that guy. And when you cut it under direct vision, it can never come back. So there is, Elaine, the possibility of having that DVR procedure. Having said that, uh, most people try the RFA procedure first because you got 60, 80, 10. 60% of the people get 80% relief for an average of 10 months. Um, I know complete sedation isn't possible, so it's a painful procedure. Yes. So you want to be awake during your radiofrequency ablation procedure because they're mucking around with your nerves, and if they're by the wrong nerve, you want to know that. So yeah, you can't be completely sedated, but you can be a lot sedated. You can be, you can be loopy, you can be loose, you can be uh, highly sedated, but not completely. Um, the thought of the pain sends my anxiety level really high. I'm sorry. It's a very safe procedure, though. Uh, pain is just, you know, pain is pain. It's, it's why those doctors have a job, right, to get rid of it. It's not good. But um, it, it's not fun, and I, I understand why it makes you feel that way. I had an epidural injection for a herniated disc previously without sedation, and it was painful. I even thought it was, even though it was successful. Yeah, you know, a lot of times people have, uh, so it is uncomfortable. There's no, it doesn't feel good. Um, some people find it moderately, mildly to moderately painful. Other people find it really severe. My experience has been the people who find it severely painful have some component of PTSD, post-traumatic stress response. Maybe you had a really nasty school nurse who you hated who gave shots and you cried in front of the whole class and you were humiliated and so you you look every time you see a needle now you start breaking out in a cold sweat or maybe something happened to someone you know whatever it is there's there's more to it than the actual pain of the procedure i myself gave over a thousand epidurals and i never sedated anyone for it so it's definitely possible they were not in pain, in significant pain. You can talk people through it. Having said that, if you do have this PTSD response, you need sedation. And the easiest way to get that is to see a board-certified anesthesiologist as your pain management doctor or a board-certified physiatrist. 
By the way, check out my video that was released this week on how to pick a pain management doctor. Really helpful and goes through a lot of these issues. But they can arrange to have one of their colleagues come and really maximally sedate you to the safest extent possible for any pain procedure that you need. My quality of life has been severely affected. I love the way we say that. My quality of life has been severely affected. Like, oh, is it going to rain today? That, that means you're not the mother you want to be or you're not the grandmother, or you're not able to go on that dream vacation with your husband or by yourself, or you're just not able to do the things you wanna do, that's a fatal disease. <laughs> I mean, if you had cancer and you couldn't go on a trip, everyone would be like, oh, I'm so sorry, Elaine, you have that cancer. Either way, the problem is that you can't go on the trip, right? I mean, so you can't go on the trip, Elaine, you gotta do something. And your condition, spondylolisthesis without stenosis, is eminently treatable. So I really encourage you. I know it's hard, and I know I'm asking you to be brave when I don't even know you, but I do know you. <laughs> I know people just like you. You gotta find the courage to get this treated because there's a way better life for you on the other side of this. And the pain of these treatments is not in any way a legitimate barrier compared to the potential benefit of these treatments. Um, my only choice seems to be to have to go to live with the condition. Nope, that's not true. Spondylolis thesis without stenosis is controllable. The pain is controllable 100% of the time. I can't tell you how far your doctor is going to have to go to control it, but that is a controllable condition. If you're living with that pain, you are making a choice to live with that pain and not vice versa. No, 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 no. You can't say, oh, I'm too afraid to have the treatments and so uh, it's incurable. No, that's not the way it works. You gotta find within yourself a doctor with whom you can partner and you feel safe and comfortable enough and secure enough to get the treatment that you deserve. Everyone deserves help when they're sick or in pain. Everyone, and that includes you. Stop it with the martyr stuff, Elaine, you can do this. I know the reasons why patients can't be completely sedated, but do you see any changes in the future uh, for having back procedures like this done with complete sedation? No. The best indicator for a surgeon that a person is um, safe is that they're okay. And so uh, a lot of these procedures, you need to be a little bit conscious, but not very much. All right, well, you gave me a lot to unpack there, Elaine. Well, thanks for that really good question. Um, sir, I want to share my MRI report with you for your guidance. What should I do to reach you? That is an excellent question, M. Vikram Srinivas Desi. That is really an excellent question, and the answer is go to my website. If you go to my website and submit a question, ask for more information, we can upload it. Let me show you where that is. So this is Phoenix Spine and Joint. This is my website, www.phoenixspineandjoint.com. This is a show I was doing called The Clinic, where we saw patients live. Here's how you can find some surgeons. Now, select resources, and then best practice, and that is right here, the very one of the very top ones. You're going to come to this page, best practice with Dan Lieberman, MD. That's me. That's me. And see right here, see this form, you guys? Fill this out. Fill that form out and I will, um, uh, my staff will get back to you. They'll show you how to upload your MRI. Come on the show. I do interviews, you've probably seen them on YouTube. I would love to go through the MRI with you so I can hear your story and then compare it to the MRI because that's where the magic happens. It's when you compare your symptoms and I mean, I can hear it on a written question fine. I can read it on a written question, but hearing it from the horse's mouth is, is so much better. And if I can compare that with the MRI, we can really zone in on what's probably gonna be best for you and get you pointed in the right direction. So uh, do it, come on the show. I'd love to, love to meet you and love to see you. All right, another, another big one. Uh, let me blow this up a little bit so I'll make sure you guys can read it. This is from Brian Sanchez. Hi, Brian, how you doing? Great video. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I love making them, so thanks. I'm 24 and I've got a herniated disc. Bummer, seems so young. You know, you're about the age of my kids. I always feel really sorry for people in their early 20s dealing with this kind of stuff. 
I had back spasm or back problems since I was a, uh, was younger. Doctor says it doesn't look very good as I've lifted heavy stuff in bad form. So not much this past year. I started playing soccer and it looks like I have back pain every time I play. So I decided to get an MRI to see what was going on and hope it's not too late. Hopefully it can heal on its own with physical therapy after this latest injury almost a week ago. The painful part was that the first two days I could hardly walk and stand up, but pain was only in my back, but it's very sharp and now I'm doing much better. Um, so I get where you're coming from, Brian. It's really natural to, when you have pain, to say, hey, let's let, we're flying blind here, right? Let's get a look, let's get an MRI and see what's going on in there. It's just that studies have consistently shown that people do worse when they approach it that way. Let me say that again, because it doesn't, it's counterintuitive, it certainly was for me. But that's called early MRI, and studies have shown that when you get an early MRI, you tend to have a worse outcome. The reason is you have to drive treatment decisions based on what's happening at the moment. Looking at the MRI, you might have had a herniated disc when you were, when did you say this started? You were much younger, as I recall in your question. So that, we might be seeing changes that aren't painful anymore from a long time ago. And if a surgeon or a doctor acts on those old changes, there's no born on date on an MRI. You can see the problems, but you don't know when they happened. And it's really tricky to line them up with the kind of pain you're having. So your approach is actually known to be the wrong one getting an MRI to see what's going on. So, uh, but I, I totally understand where you're coming from, but uh, I would try to back away, pull energy out from that. Get, next time you get an MRI, Brian, it should be because you've tried home care for three weeks, you have ridiculous symptoms, and they may need an epidural or to assess your back after 12 weeks of continuous pain if you're thinking about having surgery, something of that nature. But the indications we've got so far aren't good ones. Uh, very sharp now, I'm doing much better, but I still feel like the pain is not, uh, just feels sensitive after six days I can walk, but I could use some advice. I love soccer, running and training with my daughter, and I wonder if I'm ever gonna be able to do it again. I'm in Texas, but I'd love to go to Phoenix for a consultation. Um, I'm not a practicing doctor, but I'd be happy to try to guide you toward the right care there in Texas, or um, you're certainly welcome. I certainly know people here in Phoenix as well. But th let's face it, there's good doctors in Texas too. Look, there's basically three kinds of problems with uh, the back that lead to the need for intervention or care. And the thing that I want to point out to you is that instead of, we, we always equate severity with surgery, right? Well, if it's really bad, then I'm willing to take the risk of surgery. That is not the way it works. That's like saying, if I really need to get this screw out and it's a Phillips head screw, but all I have is a flathead screwdriver, if, if I really need to get it out, I'll use my flathead screwdriver. It's, it won't work. The, the Phillips head screw requires a Phillips head screwdriver. Your back pain requires the right treatment for it, no matter how severe it is. So think about that for a second. That's another thing, another mistake I see people making that leads them along with early MRI, along with uh, desperation due to pain, to just try to make bad decisions that lead to bad outcomes. And uh, believe me, brother, no matter how bad it is right now, it's been worse for someone else. It can always get worse. And so you don't want to you don't want to uh, you don't want to stick your head in the tiger's mouth, in the lion's mouth, and and make things worse. All right, well, let's talk about okay, okay, Dr. Dan Downer, right? So that's all the stuff that doesn't work. What does work? Here's what works: if you have back pain, and you first thing you should do is do a red flag survey. Do you have a history of cancer? Are do you, are you um, are you able to walk? Do you have functionally limiting numbness or weakness? Are you passing blood? Do you have any symptoms of infection? If all of those things are negative, then you should try three weeks of moist heat, mechanical interventions like chiropractic or acupuncture or massage, followed by at the end, and if you wanna take medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or muscle relaxant, absolutely no narcotics. Narcotics are not indicated for acute back pain. That means they're not appropriate. So no, no. Um, I'm still Dr. Dan the Downer, right? 
Um, but anyway, so you do those things for three weeks. If you're not better, you go see a doctor. You're going to get an x-ray no matter what. He's gonna, they're going to send you for x-ray. If you're having radicular symptoms, mostly in the leg, numbness or weakness, uh, changes in reflexes on examination, then you're going to get an MRI at that three-week point. Why? Because if the MRI shows a herniated disc, then you can get an epidural injection at that point to try to control the pain while it gets better on its own. The x-ray is to look for a fracture, compression fracture, or um, signs of infection, uh, haziness around the end plates. That can be a condition called discitis, disc infection. God forbid some strange tumor pops up out of the blue, out of nowhere, right? So all those things are very important um, and uh, should be considered. But at six weeks, if you're not getting better, now you need to start going to either, either figuring out either this is joint pain, which by the way shows up on the x-ray, either this is joint pain and you're down that radiofrequency ablation track, or this is a disc tear, or it's not nerve root pain because we've already gotten you the MRI. So if it's a disc tear, we try to get better with physical therapy. If that's not working, uh, then we're going to try, we're going to get the MRI next. If it's joint pain, then we're going to try a medial branch block and radiofrequency ablation with the pain management doctor. Hopefully that's going to work. And if all of that doesn't work, then you get the MRI and go see a surgeon. That's by 12 weeks. So let me point something out. There's nobody in there that we gave up for dead, right? We left no person behind. There's treatments for all of these conditions. It's about finding out, it's about making the right move at the right time in the right sequence to be sure you don't get over-treated, get treatment that you don't need, but similarly to be sure you don't get under-treated so, and miss out on treatments that could have helped you. To be honest, uh, we're... We're more concerned about over-treatment as a society because government pays for half of our health care. They don't want to waste their money on over-treatment. And insurance companies, it's their money, right? They, although it's your money, you paid the premiums, but they don't want to pay out unless they have to. So there's a lot of concern about over-treatment, but what I see every day is under-treatment. I see people who are suffering in pain when they could have had treatments that really would have helped and they didn't for a variety of reasons. Either they didn't know or they didn't, couldn't afford it, didn't have access, all these other things, but which are horrible. But undertreatment is just as big a problem, maybe a bigger problem than overtreatment. All right, my friend, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. That's what's going on. So a lot going on there, um, but important. Emanuela Illy. Emanuela Illy. Illy? 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 Either way, that Emanuela, that's a beautiful name. So thank you for your question. I like you already, and I don't even know you. I'm a fitness addict. Very cool. When I discovered I have a disc herniation, I was so sad. I hope it will get better. Uh, hey, no. Everyone has disc herniation. There's nobody on earth who's over 17 that doesn't have some pathology of their disc. It's like discovering that you had wrinkles. You're going to get them. I mean, it's part of life right? There's no, nobody gets off the ride without going around and it's, it's just the way it works. And so you have to realize disc disease, disc pathology is normal part of life. If you're able to be competitive and uh, you didn't tell me how old you are, but if you're able to be active and competitive and that is your best protection. I was a spine surgeon for 20 years almost. And I got to tell you, the, um, I would see the occasional triathlete or really great runner, but the vast majority of my patients weren't there because they hurt themselves doing fitness. They were there because they weren't fit enough. Strength and muscle tone and power is by far the most important thing you can do to protect your body. We talk a lot on this channel about um, uh, anti-inflammatory diet, which is very important to reduce inflammation, using food as medicine, which is great potential. But those things are very, very, that's weak sauce compared to strength. Strength is where the rubber meets the road. It's the tires in your drive. It's the, it's the giddy up in your own, like it's, it's critical. And so you gotta have strength. And 
If you want to get that strength uh, being a gym rat or a fitness addict, good for you, Emanuela. That's super important. Do it. And don't let anybody hold you. Did you say you have a herniated disc? You did. I want to show you something else, Emanuela, before I leave your question altogether. So this is a, um, this is a drawing of a section of the lumbar spine. And here's the nerve roots in the spinal canal. And here's where the nerve roots come out and go off to the side and they leave. And this is a disc, the blue. So this is the tough outer part called the annulus. And this is the blobby stuff called the nucleus. And the blob is gonna, if you get a, if you get a herniated disc, that's where the blob comes out. It just so happens to come out almost every time right on the nerve root that irritates the nerve root and causes the pain down the leg, which is called sciatica. This stuff, this blobby stuff can't heal. It's, it's just not capable of it. It's got no blood supply. It's not good tissue. It's a shock absorber. It's like uh, asking the couch on your, the cushions on your couch to heal, right? They don't, they're cushions. They don't heal. Like, they don't do that. So uh, pigs don't fly, buddy. So that's... Um, I don't care how beautiful your name is, Emmanuel. Your pigs don't fly either. So that's that's just the way it is. This thing, the annulus, it can heal a little bit. I mean, not a ton, but it can definitely heal. And it takes about six weeks. So if you've had a disc herniation and you've recovered for about six weeks, you'll get some scarring and healing in there that is pretty much as strong as it's gonna be by eight weeks and certainly by 12 weeks. So by the time you're 12 weeks out, stop babying yourself. If you still have a disc herniation, then something else may need to be done. All right, I'm not joking this time. I'm gonna leave that leave Emanuela alone and go on to ZDS Zadiris. Zadiris, ZDS Zadiris, I love this. I herniated my L5 vertebrae in 2017 and I just recently re-aggravated the injury. All right, time out, time out. ZDS, what are you talking about here? So let's let's look at let's get some terms down. Um, just you know, it's not that it matters. It's just that I want to make sure we're communicating, so you get the right treatment. So vertebrae is a bone. Vertebrae that's L1 vertebrae, L2, three, four, five, S sacral bone, S1 sacrum. So in between each two vertebrae is a disc. Boomba, there. Disc is made out of cartilage. Vertebrae is made out of bone. Discs can herniate. Bones don't herniate. Bones are, are not soft and they don't herniate through stuff. You know that word herniate, it comes from hernia, to move from inside to outside. It's not a coincidence, a hernia in your groin. That's where your soft guts are coming through your abdominal wall. You get a bump. That's your guts coming, through, coming out through the herniating through the abdominal wall. In your lumbar spine, it's the disc herniating through the back, through the annulus, out into the spinal canal. Now, the L5 vertebrae also doesn't make sense. It's got to be, discs are, bones are described by, uh, L, this is the L5 bone, but the discs are described by the bones they're in between. So L4-5 disc is there, L5-S1 disc is there. So when uh, Zadiris, Mr. or Mrs. Zadiris says they have a herniated L5, it's either this or this, but it's one of those two. I just recently re-aggravated the injury and in the past four days, the pain subsided. Ooh, thank you, thank goodness. I'm terrified to get to any type of surgery done to my spine because all my family has had bad experiences with back stuff. And you should be because you don't need surgery. If you're getting better on your own, the um, so when the problem is hit disc herniation, Remember, the normal treatment is to try self-care for three weeks if you have no red flags. At the end of those three weeks, you should get an MRI. You should see your doctor and get an MRI if you're not getting better. The reason is you might benefit from epidural injection. So let's get back on track here. Let's get back on track. Um, there's nobody talking about surgery in those first three weeks unless three reasons you might. First of all, what surgery are we talking about? Microdiscectomy for herniated disc, because the problem is herniated disc, so the surgery we're talking about is microdiscectomy. Microdiscectomy is indicated early only under three conditions, and three conditions only. If you uh, cannot walk, 
you have uncontrollable pain, or you have a functionally significant motor or sensory deficit. Cannot walk includes cauda equina syndrome, bowel or bladder. Remember we were talking about the private parts and all that where, the, where your skin touches the saddle. Numbness, all that. So if you have cauda equina syndrome, that's so bad and, and or you can't walk. If you have functionally limiting numbness or weakness, that the longer a nerve root is compressed, the more likely it is to suffer permanent damage. So you don't want to sit here and wait 12 weeks. If it's so bad that if you were like that permanently, you were that numb or that weak permanently that you were functionally impaired, you couldn't walk, then you can't wait on that. You got to pull the trigger, er, pull the stop cord, emergency brake on the train, stop, I need an MRI, I need to get this fixed up and move on. But otherwise, you don't, there's no surgery to talk about during three weeks. And you haven't told me about any of those three things, so I don't think that's happening. Um, I'm at a point where I don't think I have a choice anymore wrong. You don't actually have a surgical option based on what I'm hearing. So you need to, you need to look at that. Uh, you need to look at my graphic on, on doctor recommended care of a herniated disc. I've got a whole, um, I've got a whole uh, playlist on um, low back pain and a whole playlist on a herniated disc. So here's my low back pain playlist. Go to the, go check out, the, explore the channel and check this out. I've also got a uh, herniated disc playlist, which, um, which I would urge you to check out. All right. This is from the classic car nut. Ah, I assume that means uh, classic cars. You're a classic car nut. How cool is that? Uh, I used to be the owner of, uh, got my son when he turned 16. He's now, you know, 25. But back in the day, got him a 65 Mustang. So I was a classic car owner kind of once removed at one time. Uh, I, admire your, I admire your courage, sir, <laughs> or, or madam, whoever you are. All right, so this was from the video, The Cure for Spinal Stenosis. And the classic Carnet says, so there's no exercise for stenosis caused by disc herniation. That is correct. There's no, uh, so stenosis just means narrowing. And what's narrowed is the spinal canal, the space from the back of the vertebrae to the lamina. The lamina is the roof of the spinal canal and the vertebral body is the floor, if you think of it as a room. So that is correct. There's, uh, the stenosis can come about because the joints, the facet joints have enlarged over time due to arthritis and the roof, the ligamentum flavum, which connects the levels has gotten thicker. So if you get degenerative stenosis, that's because your roof's coming down and your walls are moving in. There's another way and that's where a disc herniates and that's where the floor is rising. The room's getting smaller because the floor is rising. And what we see all the time, unfortunately, is all that is happening at the same time. Sometimes a disc herniation in someone who already has moderate stenosis makes it severe stenosis. That's very common, very common sequence. So I uh, hope that's not you, but uh, the question then is, okay, well, could I do exercises to undo that? No. What exercise gets rid of a herniated disc? None, there is none. All right. Let's keep her going. Uh, this was a question that came from a video, uh, one of my The Clinic series, um, and that was a clinic about a herniated disc. The sharpest pain I've ever had, I'll be dead by morning herniated disc. Felt like I would be dead by morning. And um, this is from Joe S. Hi, Joe. Joe, what do you consider large? I consider large disc is 10 millimeters or greater. Um, a small disc is three to five millimeters on MRI. A medium-sized disc is usually 5 to 10, and a large disc is greater than 10. And then you get some that are, the whole spinal canal is about 25 to 30 millimeters wide. A disc that, in, that takes up the entire spinal canal can be 25 or even is pushing 30 millimeters. So I know the, the, um, the metric scale, the centimeters, you know, it's millimeters, centimeters, uh, kilometers. It's not one that we Americans are very used to. But Joe S, I, I don't know if you're American or not, but it's, it doesn't matter that we're in millimeters. Just know if you're, look on your MRI report, they'll measure that fragment. If it's less than 10, it's, it's, it's uh, small or moderate. If it's less than five, three to five, 
and it's small. How am I going to hold my own leg and do those tests? Oh, this is on, is your knee pain coming from an ACL tear or a meniscus injury? How can you tell? And uh, that's a uh, video with my colleagues, Amy and Ashley. And Dr. Amy, who's a chiropractor, examines Ashley's knee and she moves it. And so remember that um, these tests are to define whether you've got an ACL tear like Lachman's test or a meniscus injury, which is McMurray's test. Lachman's test is, uh, remember how the ACL holds the knee together? So here's the knee from the front. Now we're gonna turn him around and from the back, this is actually the cruciate ligament. See how it's shaped like a cross? See how it could be a cross? Anyway, you can't see the ACL, but it's, if you look from the front, you got the kneecap in the way. So we're just gonna look from the back. So the ACL, it, it starts in the front and it inserts in the back. So it locked, it prevents the, the knee from going this way. See that? You don't want your knee to go like that, right? <laughs> that looks painful. So um, that's the ACL that prevents that. So what we do in Lachman's test is we have the person lie down, bend their knee 20 degrees, and then we try to pull this one, pull it apart. That's Lachman's test for the ACL. McMurray's test is different. The, the, um, the meniscus is a horseshoe-shaped uh, piece of cartilage here on the leg bone that cushions where the thigh bone meets it in the knee. And you can see the meniscus, if you rotate the knee, you're gonna bring out any pain that's coming from a meniscal tear. So McMurray's test is you bend the knee and then rotate it and then straighten it. That gets the rotation, puts the bones together right on the meniscus. When you straighten it, it runs the full length of range of motion. So um, the question, that Robert Guthridge asked was, well, how am I gonna do those tests by myself? And the answer is, you cannot. Roberto, no, no go -o. You can't do these tests by yourself. You can't, uh, you can't bend your knee and passively range it. Uh, another part of that is if you're holding power on your knee yourself, you're like, well, why can't I just rotate my leg and rotate my ankle and then straighten my knee? Because you're now involving all the ligaments and muscles and tendons. So in the movement, the point of having someone else do it is it's passive from your point of view. You're relaxed. That, that's how we uncover the issue. This is going to come up again. Somebody, somebody else asked a question about these tests. Um, let me blow that up. Roman Globen, Roman Globen, thank you so much for this video and the previous editions. I'm going to consult with my neurosurgeon today with the same problem. I hope he'll perform the necessary surgery ASAP. Great video. Thank you so much, Roman Globen, for your very kind compliments. This was another episode of The Clinic, and uh, it was the one where we were talking about microdiscectomy, microdiscectomy, very important topic. So, uh, Roman, the indications for microdiscectomy surgery, again, are um, a disc herniation causing radiculopathy, which is sciatica. That's the pain that goes down the leg. It should be done early if there's functional numbness or weakness, intractable pain, or cauticoinus syndrome, or you can't walk. It can be done after 12 weeks if you fail, um, you fail epidural injection and you fail the test of time the 12 weeks, but understand that your body heals discs anyway. So what you get by having surgery is you speed up time. If you could wait it out, your body's gonna heal on its own. Not everyone can do, can wait it out. I mean, Jesus, 12, 12 weeks, that's three months already, right? I mean, that, you've waited long enough. And so it can just be like, hey, we need to get this over with. I understand that completely. Uh, this is Sid Praveen. Shid Praveen, how can I buy? Uh, how can I buy what? Oh, this is from, does CBD from cannabis help with arthritis? Uh, yes, CBD does help with arthritis because our bodies have an endocannabinoid system. CBD is a drug. It binds to receptors in the body. One of the things it does is reduce inflammation and reducing inflammation reduces pain. That's why non anti-inflammatory drugs, steroids are an anti-inflammatory. Anti-inflammation is anti-pain because pain is a mediator of inflammation for most people. So, okay, where do I get CBD is the question. First of all, I'm glad you're asking. 
And the reason is, um, I'm glad you're asking because a lot of stuff is sold in this unregulated market of nutritional supplements, things like CBD, are sold without even containing the actual product you're supposed to get. So you wanna buy the product from someone you trust, who's knowledgeable, who can explain to you how they are a purveyor. How do they know the stuff they bought? Well, because an outside lab checked it or they had it checked or, you know, there has to be some kind of verification process. You wanna make darn sure you get that in anything that you buy. So that's how you know where can you get it. You know, in on the channel, if you go to our CBD playlist, um, I uh, interviewed a lady named Kathleen. I forget the name of her little store, but I had 100% confidence in her. You can order from her by mail. She can ship. She also does amazing consultation. She'll walk you through, well, how much should I take? What dose? And it comes as a tincture, as a weed that you can smoke. It comes as a gummy that you can chew. It comes as tincture drops you put under your tongue. How, what's the right way to take it? It depends on how quickly you need the relief and how much and how often and why you're taking it in the first place. If it's a joint, a lot of people recommend you apply to, and I think in your case, uh, oh, you didn't tell me, but the, the video is about arthritic pain, so joint pain. A lot of people want to apply that as a cream. But anyway, Kathleen can walk you through that. Give her a call or check her out online. Go, go uh, look, look up Kathleen on, on my website with the interview that I did, please. Delightful lady, very knowledgeable. This is from DKAZ, D -K, capital K-A-Z. Don't waste your time with injections, just get the microdiscectomy. Getting into many injections inflames the tissue and the nerve even more. And when the surgeon does get in there, you, they can tell, you can tell they're nervous, angry tissue becomes quite friable. Just my two cents from my experience. <coughs> Very interesting perspective, for sure. Um, yeah, most surgeons don't see it that way. I mean, I've, uh, I, I did thousands of microdiscectomies, to be honest, and I'm not sure I noticed any effect from steroid. I didn't notice any effect from steroid in there. Having said that, um, it's your choice, your body, your choice, right? You don't have to have epidural injection. It's, it has no impact. It's been studied and shown to have no impact on the long-term outcome. It's just a way to control the pain while you're healing. So if you are waiting to have a microdiscectomy to see if you go the 12 weeks, then it's something to consider. If you don't wanna do it, don't do it. I don't know, you know, that's entirely personal perspective. If I had a huge needle phobia, I wouldn't do it. Or if I didn't like drugs or you know, if I was a natural man, that kind of thing, nothing wrong with that, brother, good for you. Um, but uh, most people do wanna try it. I guess what I'm trying to say is the, the, the question made it sound like, hey, just skip the injections and go get the surgery. That's not how it works. The injections are, you're a candidate for the injections if you're not a candidate for the surgery yet, and you wanna wait and see how you do. So they're a way to control the pain. Don't think of it as, oh, I'm gonna have the injections so that I hope I don't need the surgery. Th that they have no impact on one another. I guess that's, I guess I, I said it, but it took a while. <laughs> a little roundabout, roundabout way of going. And again, uh, please think of this in terms of the doctor recommended treatment time frame. So the epidural injection, if you have radicular pain, you get an MRI along with your x-ray at three weeks, then you're looking at epidural injection by six weeks. Where's microdiscectomy surgery? It's out here at 12 weeks right? So it's not the same thing. You don't, there's no microdiscectomy surgery here unless you have functional numbness or weakness, intractable pain, or catechoinous syndrome. Make sense? I hope so. I know it's complicated. That's why we need a doctor. We need a doctor because, uh, you know, everyone's entitled to help when they're sick or in pain, and um, usually that's a doctor or a qualified person. German Diego, hello, hello. Nice to meet you, German Diego. Herman, Herman, I don't know where you're from, but it could be Herman Diego. Good to meet you. I just received, and it's hello, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. So I grew up with a lot of Hermans. I think it was probably Herman Diego. So nice to meet you. Um, I just received my MRI and talked to my doctor. She recommended surgery for my herniated disc. I want to heal naturally. I think I can handle the pain for 12 weeks more. 
but the pain started since February. Is there a better way I can talk to you for recommendations? I'm 21 years old. Oh, yes, there is, Herman. Please come on my show. I'd love to meet you. I'd love to look at your MRI, get a sense of the size of that disc. I want to see the look on your face, how much pain you're actually in. Are you pale and miserable? Are you sucking it up? Are you what, What's going on, buddy? So I would love to talk to you. Come on the show. And the way to do that is to go to phoenixspineandjoint.com, resources, best practice, top left of your screen, fill out that consult form. Hey, by the way, spoiler alert, peoples, we're coming up with a really cool video submission process. So soon, instead of just typing this stuff in, you're going to be able to drop me a video with your question. So I'm super excited about that. And uh, more, more, on that, more on that in the week to come. But, uh, uh, you know, connect with me, Armand. I'd love to talk to you and see what's going on. Dan Scott. Hey, Dan, I think we've talked before. I have a transplanted kidney. Yes. Ike, poor guy, but good for you. You're cross, you're cross and you're bearing it from it sounds like. I can't take too much acetaminophen. MRI reveals a ton of tissue causing pain. What other anti-inflammatory drugs are outside of steroid injection? Uh, I got to tell you, Dan Scott, when I'm um, dealing with renal transplant patients, I get a nephrologist involved. I'm a doctor, but not like that. That's over my head. You don't want, um, you don't want, you want a specialist with something that could have big impact on that transplanted kidney. So not, unfortunately, not a question for me. That's a question for your kidney specialist. Um, unless they tell you the answer is narcotics, in which case you need to find a different specialist. So uh, I think it's probably best to leave that to them. Doctor, I did my MRI and it looks like I have a herniated disc at L4-5 and L5-S1, Sadikim. I'm sorry to hear that, but uh, thank you for contacting me. You come to the right place. I don't have any numbness, but the pain radiates through my right leg all the way down. Okay, so that pain down the leg from a herniated disc is sciatica. So you have sciatica due to a herniated disc. This pain is not, this pain is only felt if I sit down for long. Usually pain that's worse when sitting is, do, is an annular tear, but an annular tear is a knife in the back and doesn't radiate down the leg. So presumably what's happening here is when you sit down, you're, getting, uh, you're putting stress on that nerve root. You're pushing that nerve root right up against that uh, disc that's irritating it, and that's what's causing the sciatica. When I stand up and do some walking, it slowly reduces. Do you think it'll heal by itself if I'm willing to wait? It very well may. The, the all discs heal by themselves. The question is, if it's too big, it's just more than your body can do in a reasonable amount of time to get better. So it has to do with the size of the disc. It has to do with your body, the kind of immune response you generate. Sometimes these darn things are painful, which means the inflammation is, is uh, turning on pain nociceptive, pain fibers that are sending that signal right up to the brain. Sometimes it's not. If it's not painful, we can be a lot more flexible about giving more time for your body to get better. So it's really all over the place. And the only way to know for sure is to look at you in the face, find out how you're functioning, the level of pain you're in, look at the MRI, consider the size of the disc, and any other information that's available, and uh, make a comprehensive decision. And like everyone else, Sadiqim, I would invite you to come on the show and upload your MRI and do that if that's appealing to you. This is from Noib, N-O-Y-B. No Y-B or Noib, I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, that was a really nice explanation. Oh, this is from my colleague Amy and Ashley's video, is your knee pain coming from the ACL tear or meniscus injury, how to tell? Yes, it really is a cool video, check it out. It's actually our hottest video right now on the channel and I can see why, I mean, it's really, really helpful. Um, which test is more accurate for ACL, Lachman's test or the anterior drawer? Remember, it's the knee, right? And the ACL, this is the posterior cruciate ligament, but we're going to look at it. The ACL prevents the knee from sliding that way, prevents the knee from sliding that way. If it tears, like it's shown here from the front, it's torn right there, then the knee slides too much. And we can bend the knee 20 degrees, put the arm on the thigh and the leg and do that, or we can put them both on the 
calf and pull it in and out at various levels. That's the anterior drawer. If you look at this stuff online, you find all kinds of stuff. Like here's, if you Google Lachman, L-A-C-H-M-A-N's test, here's the Lachman's test. They're showing you how to do it. And then they talk about the difference between Lachman's test and the anterior drawer. Um, actually, you know, when you want to find out what is what, you look and see, well, has somebody studied this in the past? And sure enough, the... Um, the, uh, uh, this question has been asked in the literature, what's more accurate, the Lachman or the anterior drawer? And I looked it up, and at least one study found they were the same. By the way, this test is really smoke and fire good test. It's very nearly as accurate as an MRI in predicting whether there's an ACL tear when you compare the both results to arthroscopy. So if you don't have access to an MRI or you're at home or you want to just try it out, Google that Lachman's test and... Uh, McMurray's test is very similar, a really smoking good test. So definitely worth, worth not running into getting imaging and finding out what's going on. I think the other thing that really helps is to know, you want to know what's going on so you don't run in there and get, you can be an informed consumer. You don't want to get crappy care, do you? You don't deserve it. No one does. So you want to really make sure you get the right care and the way to do that is to understand how's my, you're not a doctor. Well, maybe you are, but let's say you're not. You're not a doctor, but it's still your job. It's your body. You're a consumer. You're, you're the boss, boss. You got to find out what that doctor's doing to know if they're doing their job right. If you go into a doctor with knee pain and the doctor's, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. here's a script for ibuprofen, fire them. <laughs> no. They need to do Lachman and McMurray's test. They learn this stuff in school. If they don't, tell them to get out their computer and look it up. I mean, that's not, that's not rude. That's them not doing their job right. And uh, you know what? They should. If I'm a doctor and I'm doing a crap job, I'd thank somebody for telling me. I would thank somebody for pointing out. It's not about, as a doctor, I got to tell you, and I used to be one, it's not about being the doctor. It's about helping others. The, you think your doctor became a doctor because of the authority and the prestige and the money? No. <laughs> they became a doctor because they have a deep, deep love for other people. They want to help you. And if they're not helping you, they want to know that. So don't be shy. Unlike you, who has knee pain, your doctor is going to see 40 people today, and they've got all kinds of problems, right? So don't... Um, don't, uh, it's not rude to be demanding. It's appropriate and your doctor wants you to be. All right, I think this is our second to the last question, people, which is good because we've only got five more minutes, so. Um, uh, Cypress, hi Cypress. Uh, this is on my, my video, uh, the cure for spinal stenosis. Is there a cure for spinal stenosis without surgery? No, the cure for spinal stenosis is surgery. The only way to make a small hole bigger is to drill it open. Um, I've had steroid injections and RFAs uh, for well over seven years. Can they still do surgery for spinal stenosis? Yes. Uh, RFA is a procedure where a needle is placed. So this is the spine, and these are the hardest working, least respected. James Brown! These are the James Brown joints. They, they work, they're the hardest working joints in the body. And uh, they don't always get the respect they deserve. This is the king of soul right here. So that is the facet joint. And the facet joint in this picture is right here. That's the facet joint. And this is a nerve coming into it. And it's red, indicating that it's in pain. This is a needle. And here it's being electrocuted. This is radiofrequency ablation of the nerve that goes to the facet joint to try to numb the body from back pain. And um, as I've said, if you didn't see in the prior segments, the numbers I want you to know are 60, 80, 10. Um, the RFA procedure relieves 60% of patients' pain for an average, an average of 80% of their pain for an average of 10 months. 60, 80, 10. 60% of people get 10 months relief, get 80% relief for an average of 10 months. I'm glad you know it because 
<laughs> I'm sure not helping. I, I can barely say it. <laughs> okay, you got it. You got me. 60, 80, 10. Um, so it, the thing about this is, it's, of course it's temporary, right? Like this, um, this nerve is not cut. If I went in here with an endoscope and I could see that guy, which you can, and I cut it right here with, a, this is the transverse process. I can go right in there and just cut it with a little tiny endoscopic for, uh, me, uh, scissors, which is super easy to do. Then yeah, that's permanent relief. But this is your 60, 80, 10. And uh, it's very effective, but it is very temporary. Now, stenosis is over here, right? This is inside the spinal canal. This is the lamina bone. Let's go from there to here. This is the lamina bone. It's the roof of the spinal canal. So the roof of the spinal canal is the lamina bone. So what's that got to do with this little nerve root out here? Nothing, right? So the fact that you've had RFA, can you still have uh, surgery for stenosis? Totally. You can totally have surgery for stenosis. Okay. Uh, scoli uh, spondylosis, that's degenerative changes of the spine. Think arthritis, bone spur, etc. And scoliosis, that's a curvature of the spine. The spine is normally curved in this plane. That's normal, but in this plane, it's not curved. If it were, that's scoliosis. Uh, degenerative disc disease, we've talked about that, and, may, and many herniated discs, that's part of degenerative disc disease, right? The annulus degenerates and cracks and then the nucleus herniates through, so that's the same thing. It's still possible with all of that? Yeah, it is. So stenosis is about narrowing, and if your roof's too low and you need a bigger room, you drill a roof off and you're good. You can always have a laminectomy despite any of those other things, and you must, if your stenosis, if you're narrowing, is getting so severe that it's killing the nerves. So you gotta be all over that. Last question. How could I send you my MRI? My MRI is normal, but having back pain when sitting, please help. Uh, look, I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say, your MRI is not normal. Your MRI report says that they don't see certain things they were looking for. It's not normal or you probably wouldn't be having pain. I could be wrong. There's a small percentage where they make sections in the MRI and um, they could, the, the issue could be between the sections, so it's just not visible. But having said that, um, it's not normal to have pain. So either the MRI is not showing it for some technical reason that, you know, maybe they need to get thin cuts, or maybe they did it wrong, or maybe they misinterpreted it, something technical. Or it's on the MRI and they just didn't know what they were doing, which is also impossible. So the way to deal with a normal MRI but a painful back is come on the show. Let me hear your story, let me look you in the eye, let me meet you and find out what's going on. And then look at your MRI with that knowledge. That's knowledge the radiologist didn't have, right? With that knowledge, I can probably figure out what's happening. Hey, we're almost out of time. It's the end of another week. It's really been an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with you. I hope this helps. I'm really psyched about this video submission process that we're coming into next week. Um, it's going to be very cool for me to look you, look at your face and hear you. Even if I, uh, you know, this is fine, but if I could actually see you asking the question, I'm going to get more out of it. Uh, a lot of people are shy about coming on video. I get that. I get that. Um, I don't want to put anyone in an uncomfortable position, but I, I really can't help you as much if I don't meet you and hear from you and compare that and look at your MRI images. So think about that and have a great weekend. I'll see you next week. For best practice, I'm Dr. Dan Lieberman. Be good. If you have a question you would like answered on Best Practice Live, there are three ways to ask. Leave a comment on any of our social channels, click the link to our website and complete the submission form, or call or text us at 608-602-4022. The more information you can give us, the better we can answer your question. So please contact us and we can walk you through uploading your imaging to a secure server. Please like and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with information about your spine and joint health. Lastly, be sure to check out new episodes every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, where we answer all your questions. Thank you.